Good afternoon and welcome to the City of Hamilton's second internal town hall meeting regarding our response to the COVID-19 emergency and Hamilton reopens. My name is Jasmine Graham and I'm a senior communications officer in the city manager's office and once again your host for this internal town hall. This afternoon we're joined by a panel of our senior leaders from the city. I'd like to welcome our city manager Jeanette Smith, our Emergency Operations Center Director and General Manager of Healthy and Safe Communities, Paul Johnson, our General Manager of Public Works, Dan McKinnon, our General Manager of Finance and Corporate Services, Mike Segarek, and Laura Fontana, our Executive Director of Human Resources. Thanks everyone for participating in the panel this afternoon. For staff watching us on YouTube or listening in our phone in line, we're here to answer your questions and we'll get to as many as possible. To submit a question for our panel today, you can email us at communications at hamilton.ca. To start things off, I'd like to welcome our city manager, Jeanette Smith, with some opening remarks. Jeanette, over to you. Hi, everyone from uh, Team Hamilton. Thank you for joining us for our second virtual town hall meeting. I hope you found the first one helpful and this one just as much. And I hope by now we all, you all know that we are in officially in phase two for our three phase reopening plan. And um, just a reminder, it is a three phase plan. It does not have specific dates on it because we do have to monitor and uh, take advice from public health and looking what's happening both at the provincial orders and locally here. And I want to just repeat a key message from our first one, and that is slow, gradual, safe, and measured. And so what it does mean is over the next while, we are bringing some additional services online with all the appropriate public health measures and a few more staff may be coming back to the office. Um, but for many of us, a lot of it will stay the same in that we'll continue to work from home. So we look forward to uh, giving you some more information today and answering questions. And uh, I look forward to um, seeing you all soon in other virtual uh, settings. Back to you, Jess. Thanks so much, Jeanette. So uh, next we're going to hear a brief presentation by our Emergency Operations Center Director and General Manager of Healthy and Safe Communities, Paul Johnson. So Paul, if you're ready, I'll turn things over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jasmine, and, and hello, everybody. Uh, the last time we had uh, one of our internal town halls, I started by talking a little bit about uh, the, the many staff people who have continued to deliver services right through this, this crisis. Uh, the folks that deliver critical services, essential services, emergency services in our city, and we had some great examples of, of that. Today, I wanna to start by talking a little bit about another group of people in the city uh, who have really stepped up uh, through this pandemic and those that have been redeployed or are taking on other roles as a result of this emergency. And you know, it's, it's one thing when you arrive at work and you say, yeah, here's my job and it's changing because of COVID-19 or changing because of this emergency. It's a whole other thing to arrive and say, well, not only is my job changing, but I'm not gonna do my job. I'm gonna go and do something else. And there's some really inspiring stories of how, uh, as we all know, uh, the, the ability for us to deliver great public service is something we celebrate all the time and it's happening with the redeployment as well. It's folks like Jake Parkhill who uh, works uh, normally as a senior receptionist in recreation and was reassigned to a reception at our one of our long-term care facilities, in fact, at Wentworth Lodge. And not only is Jake doing a great job just uh, helping out with the, the increased needs administratively at Wentworth Lodge, uh, he's quickly jumping into the reality of dealing with our, our older adult population there. And one of the stories that came back was how Jake one day uh, spent 30 minutes outside one of our heat alert days uh, with a resident who was a little confused, thought his family was coming back to pick him up and take him uh, on a trip. And, and of course that wasn't uh, happening. And Jake spent the time uh, to sit, to talk, to uh, work with uh, that individual and encourage him to come inside where obviously it was much cooler and, and make sure that he was safe. And, 
taking that time working with older adults who are sometimes uh, dealing with dementia and other issues uh, shows me that uh, you know one day in recreation the next day in long-term care it's the same concept delivering great customer service it's uh, like the dream team of screeners as they call them at Macasa Lodge uh, under the leadership of Melissa Dale and Eleanor Morton a team of people who are helping with the screening of staff and of uh, uh, volunteers and of uh, people from the community who are coming to our long-term care facilities and just as a bit of a size and scope across both of our long-term care facilities about 800 employees work each day they need to be actively screened uh, for any symptoms of, of COVID-19 and to have staff who are already working at long-term in the long-term care facilities do that meant, meant they were pulled away from direct client service so we created a team of redeployed staff to help with the screening and they've just done an incredible job of uh, getting to know uh, the residents, getting to know the families now that we're into visitation, and obviously getting to know all the staff and helping to keep our long-term care facilities safe. It's folks like Shan, uh, Shannon uh, Leanders who uh, works normally in administration in human resources and was redeployed to our supplies depot. Very early on, the EOC uh, made the decision that we would centralize our supplies of uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, and ensure that we could do two things. One is uh, procure those items that are necessary, and then ensure that we were delivering them to the right people and the right priority so that we could preserve our PPE stocks as best as we could and make sure that everybody was kept safe. It has been a large effort by a number of people, but folks like Shannon jumped in, uh, have uh, changed her usual shoe attire to the steel-toed shoes, and along the way, has actually received her license as a forklift operator. Uh, and I can tell you probably on March the 10th and 11th before we activated the EOC, I'm not so sure Shannon thought that she would be with the city of Hamilton getting her forklift license. Cole G Gately, who works in human resources, uh, he was reassigned to our isolation shelter. This was set up for homeless uh, men and women who, who, if they tested positive for COVID-19, were provided a shelter which was isolated from the rest of the population. So obviously they could recover and not uh, increase the spread within our existing shelter system. Uh, Cole has a long history of working with vulnerable populations and that experience in his background came to the fore. He intervened when one of the residents was uh, of the isolation shelter was trying to go on a bit of a walk and go and do some things, which obviously when you're isolating with COVID-19, you can't do. And even uh, cajoled another person who was staying there back into the shelter with cereal of all things. So um, actually Cole has got the nickname now as, as Captain Crunch. You know, for Brenda Silverthorne, who works as a community development worker in City Housing Hamilton, uh, it was about taking a very loose approach to having a temporary food bank at City Housing Hamilton and actually turning it into a much more sustainable uh, approach to food security. Reaching out uh, with uh, her team and her colleagues to over 6,000 of our tenants at uh, City Housing Hamilton and ensuring that they have the things that they need to make it through this pandemic. Of course, City Housing Hamilton uh, has a lot of vulnerable residents and a lot of residents without a lot of extra disposable income and ensuring that they were healthy and safe through this pandemic is something that uh, Brenda jumped into in, in a great way. For Kelly Barnett, it was about being being reassigned from planning and economic development to the emergency operations center as our uh, council liaison. And if you can imagine the amount of uh, phone calls and emails one might get from all of council uh, into a single portal to answer some of those questions from the EOC, uh, Kelly was pretty busy, did it with a, a, a great deal of skill, and also then allowed the EOC not to have to spend a whole bunch of time always answering emails coming into all sorts of us. It was through a common portal, worked for council, worked for the EOC and uh, we were really thankful that Kelly was reassigned uh, to that. To Christy Tattison and Jocelyn Strutt, uh, who are part of a team of about 18 people that are that are supporting the vulnerable sector throughout our community, not just at City Housing Hamilton. These folks are delivering food, they're setting up meals, they're making sure people have transportation. They are on the road and in the community and coming from a variety of, of areas, including uh, children's and neighborhood development uh, area, as well as our recreation division. And they have throughout this pandemic done two things. One is make sure that anybody who needed to isolate who was unable because of their their income levels or other uh, 
factors were unable to get the kinds of supplies they needed to maintain their isolation, we made sure that they could isolate and still be, still be healthy from a food perspective and a connection perspective. But they've expanded that too, to make sure that those who are vulnerable, our elderly, our low income residents have access to some of those supports as well. So I really uh, thank them for that. I know Carrie Lindsay wasn't exactly redeployed as our occupational health nurse, occupational health nurse of one, but it probably felt like she was a bit redeployed because all of a sudden the work that uh, Carrie has had to do in terms of helping us build our, our uh, responses and our policies and our procedures around how to screen and test and follow up with staff uh, from a COVID-19 perspective, uh, it has been a size of workload that I, I'm sure, again, uh, she couldn't have imagined in the early parts of this uh, pandemic. And so some people have, uh, you know, stayed in their current role, but certainly redeployed in terms of their effort and energies to many, many things. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about uh, Jacqueline Durloff, who is uh, uh, you know, one of our communications officers and generally helps out in, in the city manager's office and doing some of our special projects as a city, but uh, was recently redeployed to public health services. And if you can imagine uh, taking no skills and experiences, but being redeployed to the very, very front lines of this, uh, of this emergency, this is a public health emergency. And uh, Jacqueline's jumped right in there and provided all sorts of the uh, communication support supports and hasn't missed a beat, uh, picked up right away. And, you know, for public health, they've been at this since January. And so it was coming in after months and months of works already in place and really has helped them continue uh, to do what they need to do to communicate to the public how to remain safe. And I can tell you from the mayor's perspective and my perspective, the majority of questions at the press conference are for public health. Uh, we sort of sit back and look pretty and talk about things that aren't open or uh, are being closed at the city or reopened in the city. And so the public health communication function is critically important important. But uh, when, as, I, as I end my opening remarks, I just want to say that one of the things that we've been really proud of as an emergency operations center is the way we've communicated. So highlighting the work of Jacqueline today, but uh, really that is talking about our entire communications uh, operation. And that includes communication officers. It includes those that help with graphic design, making sure that the pieces that we put out look good. It's all the folks that work behind the scenes in web design and all the rest. We have a very robust communication approach the city of Hamilton for this pandemic and it shows each and every day with the work that's going on. So I thought I'd start today with that because from an emergency operations perspective we had some of these very critical roles that had to be uh, redeployed and reassigned to staff within uh, within our organization and two things needed to happen. One is they needed to jump in both feet ready to go and they did and then the second piece is a very steep learning curve and how to operate a supply depot and all the logistics that goes with that and apparently driving a forklift to driving around the community and engaging with people that perhaps weren't the client population that people are used to working with. And so all of those things are incredibly important as we as a city have, uh, have uh, done our work to uh, ensure that we can continue to respond to this emergency. I'm going to pull up uh, uh, some slides just for, for a few minutes and, and remind everybody on the call today that uh, as of last Friday, the city of Hamilton entered into uh, phase two of our reopening strategy, along with the province of Ontario entering Hamilton into stage two of the provincial uh, recovery as well. And what that really means is, is that a number of things are now open to the, to the public and now a number of things are now available to the public that weren't available before. And some of those things um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today. So one of the first things is to remind you of what Jeanette said, which is, you know, Hamilton reopens as a phased approach. And just because we enter a new phase doesn't mean it's an event. It means we're entering a phase where things will happen over time and things are very gradual and that continues uh, today. One of the pieces about entering phase two from uh, Hamilton reopens perspective is that uh, we are looking to expand the number of services that are offered by the municipality and returning more, more staff to work. But that's not happening equally across all work areas. So some people are still very much working from home, whereas others are starting to come back to work to deliver some of the services. And so when you talk about municipal facilities and offices reopening, you know, a lot of that is based in recreation right now. Uh, the municipal golf courses have opened a few weeks ago, and now we are working very hard to open 14 indoor and outdoor pools. Uh, one of them is sort of an outdoor pool slash wading pool in Dundas, but uh, opening 14 pools across the community. And we hope to do that the week of July 6th for some, and then uh, the week of July 13th for 
for the others. And so when we talk about opening facilities, I mean, if you work in an office building, you may say, well, hey, when, when is my office being opened? And the reality is that the facilities we're focused on now really have to do with uh, some of our work in recreation. The bottom line is most though of our recreation programming out of those buildings and all the events that go along with that remain canceled. There are some things happening in recreation to do things more virtually and it's great to see that both at the younger age ranges with our early on centers and our uh, the work that's been happening there uh, since this pandemic began, but also recreation will begin to provide a few more services, but the things we're not doing this year are our SUPI program and we're not providing a day camp program through Camp Kadaka. When people do return to their places of work, we have lots of things in place uh, to ensure that, uh, that, that things will uh, be safe for you. You'll see here that Provincial Offenses Administration staff are also starting to come back to the office. Some of the things that they need to access can only be accessed in the office. And so we've started to make uh, the plans and the safe return there. It does not mean it's open to the public now, but some people are starting to return to their places of work in anticipation of opening to the public. Lots of that though focused around our recreation staff. We also know in phase two that uh, really we focused on most of our outdoor municipal amenities being open to the public and some of the new things that we've added of course are spray pads uh, all open now except for a couple that needed a bit of mechanical work and we're also starting to permit the use of sports fields so that uh, people can come and use our sports field. So that's an awful lot more work for some of our public work staff for some of our recreation staff as they try and make sure that people can get out and enjoy the amenities. Many staff continue to work from home is a big key piece of our phase two and we've uh, put up a slide here for those who can't see the, the screen I'll describe a bit of it to you is uh, some of the reasons that um, we are looking at returning staff and why there are good reasons to look at staff returning to the workplace but also some of the reasons that aren't and the reality for us now is uh, unless we have to unless there's a compelling reason to we're still having many many of our staff people at the city of Hamilton work from home and that is because the safest way to protect uh, from the spread of COVID-19 is to ensure that there's that physical distancing and no better way to do that than actually not have people in the same space. We also know that uh, there's a heightened risk when you're indoors versus outdoors and a heightened risk with the duration of time that you're indoors with people as well. So we're trying to balance off that safety element. So we do have some people that are going to be getting back to delivering frontline services. We're working with them at the Ministry of the Attorney General and we expect that uh, there will be some uh, need to open some of our facilities around our, our work in POA. Uh, obviously, we've talked about recreation at length. There may be some folks that need to uh, come into work because uh, there's special technology or special equipment that just can't be taken home. And so we're, we're starting to explore some of those things so we don't get too far behind in some of the work. And then there are occasions, as you know from our policy, where if there is just an unsuitable environment at home for people to work in, we can look at alternatives including coming back to the workplace. And again, that's more on an individual basis, not on a team basis. Some of the reasons that really aren't in our thinking around why we would return staff to uh, their places of work is that people want to return to normalcy. I just want to do the usual routine or that there's a desire to attend face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, to be honest, there'll probably be heavy restrictions on the amount of face-to-face -face meetings, the number of people that can attend face-to-face -face meetings, even when we do start to bring people back to the, the office. Uh, the desire for more social interactions and from a morale purpose, just wanting to see more people. And the reality is we'll get there. We understand that concern. But uh, right now, uh, the safest option is for us to focus on those programs that need to get back into operation, need to be back in facilities, not uh, for those that it, it might just be a nice thing to do. And then there are some other things that we need to consider in, in phase two. There's still a heavy restriction on the number of people that can gather. Uh, it's up to 10 now in the province of Ontario, but that's still a very small number of people. So no events going on in the community, uh, no public meetings where we're, we're gathering people together because obviously the goal here is to still have very few people meeting in public, unless it's part of that social circle that we have personally, where you can both relax the physical distancing uh, and also have a group of 10 people that you're most more closely connected with, but that doesn't really impact us in terms of a work environment. We've got lots of redeployed staff and I've talked about a number of them today and we're going to continue to have online services as well. 
And so at close, as I always do with uh, the reality is that uh, we have to maintain a lot of those good public health messages if we're to remain safe in the work that we're doing today. And as people return to uh, doing more work with the city, uh, that's uh, what we'll be focusing on. Uh, for instance, we're in the, we're in the process of a long, lengthy training sessions with our lifeguards and our staff, our aquatic staff, getting them ready for the opening of the pools. And much of it is focused on how do we ensure that there's proper cleaning? How do we ensure they have proper PPE? How do we ensure that we can physically distance both staff from folks coming in, but also the uh, users of our service from each other as they come through. And so all of those things are a big part of the training, uh, not just the usual stuff that we may talk about in terms of our, uh, of our pools. So I'll stop there in terms of a brief presentation. I know there's lots of questions for us to get to as well, but uh, did want to welcome today everybody as of last Friday officially into phase two of our reopening. And uh, we're continuing to make some progress along that way as we go. Great, thank you so much, Paul. So we are going to get to questions now. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question that you'd like to submit, you can email us at communications at hamilton.ca and we will do our very best to get to as many as we can. So we'll start with Jeanette for the first question. So the question is, will divisions and departments still be allowed to hold departmental wide meetings and division days where all staff from one division gather together? These are really great opportunities for people to connect. And so will these be allowed when we return to the office? Thanks, Jasmine. Well, I'll reinforce what Paul uh, put in his presentation. And unfortunately, no. And trust me, no one's more disappointed than that than me because I'm an extrovert and I like to be around people and see their faces when we meet. Um, but as you know, um, we have to, even as we bring some additional staff back, respect all those public health measures to keep us all safe and not just us that work together, but all of us and our families as well. Um, that even when people do come back, kind of those face-to-face -face meetings will be very much discouraged. Um, we're gonna have to rely on our virtual meetings um, like this one, and I've seen such amazing creativity of staff and how they can kind of make these fun and engaging and connecting uh, in other ways and still respect all those physical distancing and protect ourselves, our community and our family members as well. Great, thanks, Jeanette. So next question goes to Dan. So Dan, in our last town hall, we talked a lot about the new cleaning regiments to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 in our workplaces. Um, can you talk about whether staff are responsible for cleaning washrooms or kitchens, meeting rooms or other shared spaces and how that will work? Thanks, Jazz. Um, so generally speaking, the facilities group will be continuing to support those workplaces with our contracted services and sometimes with our own facility staff as far as the regular cleaning. When uh, different groups come back to the workplace, they may have special circumstances uh, within their own working environments that may require them to have uh, an enhanced uh, level of cleaning, uh, but that that will be up to the leaders to get a hold of the facilities help desk and organize that with facilities. But generally speaking, I would say that staff aren't responsible for the cleaning. Now, having said that, there's a lot of areas where there's kitchenettes and shared spaces um, like that. So we certainly would be encouraging people to really be diligent about cleaning those areas uh, on their own uh, because we're not gonna have uh, support to come in and clean once an hour uh, all day long. So, so I think uh, it's, it's kind of a twofold answer. The, we will have supports that will come in on a daily or twice a day basis through facilities. But we're really encouraging people to think about those infection control principles and making sure that if there's commonly touched surfaces where they know people are congregating on a regular basis, such as a kitchenette, uh, that they, they, they do a lot of cleanup after themselves as well, because that's just going to that's just going to help keep everybody safe. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next question will go to Laura. So the question is, I was wondering if the city has continued, uh, sorry, excuse me, I'll, I'll start again. I was wondering if the city has considered creating any programs to support employees who may need or want to purchase office equipment for their home. So for example, partnering with a vendor to offer an employee discount or maybe a purchasing loan like we have with computers. Um, right now, there's uh, no programs that we're um, uh, considering in terms of um, um, purchasing equipment. 
Uh, there is the computer uh, purchasing plan that uh, employees can uh, continue to take advantage of, and it's up to uh, a maximum of $2,000 uh, that's um, provided by the, uh, the city in, in terms of a re repayment plan. Uh, but at this point in time, we're not really considering a, uh, an equipment uh, purchase plan. Uh, as things evolve and, and there's other opportunities for considerations, that's certainly something that uh, we'll turn our minds to. Uh, but uh, at this point in time, we've really been focusing on the health and safety of, uh, of, the, of the home office, uh, the ergonomics and the proper setup and, and so forth. So uh, in terms of providing that uh, financial support for, for a home office or related equipment, uh, at this point in time, it isn't uh, being considered, but that's not to say that in the future, it, it won't be a consideration for, for sure. Okay, great. Thank you, Laura. So just as a reminder to everyone, if you have a question that you'd like to submit, you can email us at communications at hamilton.ca. And like I said, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, next question, we're, we'll go to Paul. So Paul, when we're thinking about the health screening criteria, a lot of the symptoms listed are similar to those of a common cold. So can you speak to what the plan is for when cold and flu season comes this fall? Um, do we anticipate that many staff will be turned away from work and what will be the plan to continue operationally? So it's a great question. And it's one that, that quite frankly, um, concerns me from the standpoint of ensuring that we we, we keep some capacity within our services. The challenge with COVID-19 is that many of the symptoms, as uh, the person who asked the question rightly pointed out, mirror other things which are, uh, you know, the sort of normal run of the mill. It could be the flu uh, to which we, we have a, a vaccine and, a, and, and all the rest and, and deal with on a yearly basis. It could be the common cold. It can, in certain cases, as we've gone through the spring, uh, mimic some uh, uh, some things around uh, allergies. So it is a challenge for us. Uh, we have seen screening criteria change throughout this pandemic. You may recall at the beginning stages, it was very much focused on travel and contact with travelers. Now, of course, it has expanded due to community spread. So we'll have to watch that. My encouragement uh, through the EOC to operational divisions has been uh, to uh, ensure that you keep a little bit of capacity because I do worry that on a couple of fronts, A, people may get sick, B, we may have screening failures that people need to be out of the office or out of the work environment for a few days while they get tested. That may come back negative and then they can come back. Uh, and then if it comes positive, they're out for a period of time and, and recovering. So there's a number of things that play into the fact that, that we're gonna have to keep a bit of capacity back, I believe, as we head into the fall. Uh, so what the screening will absolutely look like, I don't know. Uh, as I say, it's changed on a couple of occasions. So I would expect it will change again, but I doubt it will change to the point where we, we couldn't see some situations where people's other illnesses uh, mimic the symptoms of COVID-19. We need to take it seriously because you cannot tell uh, just by talking to somebody and say, well, I think those are, I think I got a cold, I'm just run down versus uh, COVID-19. And as a, as a prime example of that, um, I spent a very sleepless weekend with a number of other of my colleagues um, and not physically with them, but uh, in our separate ways, because we had a home where we had seen a large number of COVID positive tests come back. And then some other retirement homes where similar symptoms, people coughing, uh, people with a uh, runny nose, people with uh, symptoms that, that look like COVID and we did the full testing and not a single person came back as COVID-19 positive. They were all cleared. So we had one situation, they looked identical with people with symptoms. And when we did the testing, uh, found very different results. So that's a long answer to a short question, but I think that this is gonna be a challenge for us as employers as we head into the fall, because I can't see the screening changing dramatically. So we're going to have to adapt ourselves to recognizing there may be more people who need either brief periods of time out of the office to get tested or recover. And, and then uh, there may be some people who need larger time out of the office if they become ill. Great. Thank you, Paul. Next question will be to Mike. The question is, many of our staff uh, work on the front lines and some of these staff will get pandemic pay through the provincial government. Will the city be doing anything like this for those staff responding to the emergency who aren't captured under the provincial pandemic pay? Thanks, Jasmine. Um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, council has been very committed to keeping staff uh, generally uh, employed with a um, few restrictions around non-scheduling of some of our part-time staff and our seasonal staff. 
uh, and for the city of Hamilton in the midst of seeing some uh, financial challenges such as declining revenues around transit, uh, around recreation, around parking, just to name a few. Um, you know, I think that's a significant commitment uh, from our council to city employees and that is income continuity for staff. Um, Jasmine, you mentioned the pandemic pay is an initiative funded by the provincial government. Um, you'll have heard, uh, staff might have heard me say in the past, those types of initiatives are best delivered through senior levels of government. They have the financial means to deliver those types of programs and initiatives. Um, so as it relates to the question, the city is not uh, currently uh, pursuing providing pandemic pay or some other form of uh, compensation beyond what staff are entitled to under the collective agreements or under city policies. Um, and with respect to the staff who are entitled to pandemic pay, my uh, ask to those staff is please be patient. Uh, we're still working with the provincial government. Uh, we're still receiving guidelines as recent as yesterday and we're working with HR and uh, payroll and corporate services uh, to work through those guidelines and to best assess the entitlement to pandemic pay. So again, to those employees who are entitled uh, to those frontline staff, pandemic pay applies to frontline staff in some specific service areas or areas that had uh, direct contact during this pandemic uh, to uh, individuals who might have been affected by COVID. Um, our ask is please be patient, give us some time to work through the guidelines um, as it relates to the, the entitlement and uh, we'll get that processed as quickly as possible. Great, thank you, Mike. So next question goes back to Dan. Uh, so Dan, currently our washrooms only have hand dryers. I think this is a specific location. Um, would it be possible to have paper towels and garbage cans installed so that we can use a paper towel to touch the handles in the, in the washrooms? Yeah, that, I think that's an easy one, Jazz. Again, that would be a request that would be made through the facilities help desk. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, public health has made it a, uh, a decision one way or the other about the benefits of one over the other. So as far as I'm aware, either is uh, an option. And uh, I would just encourage the leaders in those workplaces to make that request through the facilities help desk. Great, thank you. Next question back to Laura. Um, Laura, if staff have their own PPE, like a mask or gloves, it, and they want to wear it in the office when they would come back, is that okay? So thanks, uh, Jazz. Um, so generally speaking, I would say uh, yes, uh, it would be okay. Uh, but we, uh, we are asking that employees um, do check in with their supervisors to make sure that uh, uh, they're they're um, they're wearing the uh, the mask in, in proper circumstances to reference the uh, standard operating procedures uh, that provide the criteria for for wearing masks and and in which circumstances. Uh, but you know, having said that, there's going to be employees that are going to feel more comfortable wearing a uh, a mask. Um, where a, a mask may, may not necessarily be uh, necessary in their workplace, but it provides them with that added level of comfort. So in those cases, um, please just check with your, your manager, make sure that uh, it's okay in, in terms of the, uh, the proper um, uh, wearing of the, of the mask, the criteria that's associated with the, the environment in which you're wearing the mask. And, uh, and even in those cases where it's not required, um, and it's a non non medical uh, mask that you're you're using. Um, it, it's it, it's just proper and uh, and uh, appropriate to have that uh, dialogue with your with your manager just to make sure that uh, it's okay. But we don't want to discourage people from uh, not wearing a mask, even though it's not uh, necessarily uh, necessary for their workplace. Uh, but uh, just to continue with that dialogue and and make sure that uh, everybody is uh, communicating properly. In, uh, in those circumstances. Great, thank you, Laura. So I'll just once again remind everyone, if you have a question that you'd like to submit for the panel, you can just email us communications at hamilton.ca. We are getting quite a number of questions. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, next question, we'll go back to Mike. So Mike, last time you talked a little bit about the budget and the deficit we're facing as an organization due to COVID-19. 
Can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe discuss some of the things our employees and leaders can do to help as we figure out how to deal with this deficit? And do we anticipate any um, reductions in programs as a result? Thanks, Jasmine. Um, just recently, we were before um, committee and provided them a uh, update as it relates to our uh, the financial impacts of COVID-19. Not only on 2020, we provided some preliminary information going into looking forward to uh, 2021. Uh, important to note that City of Hamilton's in no different of a uh, situation than other municipalities. A um, little different across the spectrum of municipalities. Some um, upper tier municipalities have less responsibilities around programs such as transit and recreation. And consequently, they um, weren't necessarily as affected as single tier or lower tier municipalities. So. Uh, important to note that we're all facing similar challenges. Um, we've taken some advocacy uh, efforts, uh, working through the Federation Canadian Municipalities, Greater Toronto Hamilton, um, in Greater Toronto Hamilton Mayors, um, trying to advocate for and leverage some funding from the federal provincial uh, governments. So our update to council uh, just provided a range of uh, the financial impacts and uh, recognizing that the values of figures were significant, not only for, you know, when a citizen hears uh, reference to 60 million to $122 million deficit, those are big numbers, significant figures, and they're big for city of Hamilton. Um, you know, those are, uh, those are financial impacts that uh, we can't necessarily just see ourselves through um, on our own, and we're going to need some support from, um, from senior levels of government. What SLT has committed to is uh, we are looking at discretionary spending. So to all the uh, people leaders is our ask is to uh, work with, uh, with your leadership, departmental leadership. We're looking at discretionary spending uh, that includes uh, conferences and training recognizing because of the COVID situation is there are restrictions in those areas, but there are still, uh, similar to this afternoon, there's still opportunities to leverage some of that through a uh, virtual platform or channel. Uh, but we are looking at constraining some of those expenditures in 2020 to try to help us through 2020 financially. Um, as well, um, we normally experience what we refer to as gapping as individuals leave the organization uh, to pursue other initiatives or retire. There's often a gap between those individuals leaving and new individuals filling those positions. And that includes, for instance, maternity leaves. Uh, we are working towards uh, realizing um, a bit more in savings uh, around gapping. Uh, potentially leaving some positions open for an extended period of time uh, to help us through 2020 uh, financially. Um, so as it relates to staff, I would just ask that you work with your leadership, look at opportunities to uh, possibly constrain some of those discretionary investments in 2020, um, help us through 2020 as well as potentially into 2021. Uh, and as it relates to program, um, you know, reducing programs, uh, currently we're not uh, looking at uh, reducing services or service levels. One of the, um, one of the um, reports or one of the categories we reported back on as on capital projects, it tends to be an area that municipalities turn to uh, first under circumstances like this is deferring capital investments. They tend to be easier to do in the more immediate term, uh, you know, an expansion to a facility or deferring a road uh, rehabilitation or an improvement to, uh, to a, uh, again, to a facility. Um, and so we do report back and we'll await further direction from council on capital projects. I suspect it's an area that other municipalities are looking at as well. Uh, doesn't necessarily help municipalities as it relates to our infrastructure deficit, but it is one of those areas that uh, we have more flexibility in the immediate term under, uh, under circumstances like this. So again, uh, just ask everyone, please be patient, work with uh, the leadership. Um, you know, we, we need to try to realize some savings uh, and we are targeting some of those discretionary 
areas, uh, as well as the potential on deferring some recruitment. Uh, and uh, I expect we'll be before council in September with another update and uh, seek some further direction from council at that time. Thanks, Jess. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, next question goes to Paul. Um, so Paul, the question is, I am one of many staff who was sent uh, to work from home back in March, but I really don't like working from home and do I have any say in when I get to return to the office? Uh, so as an individual, uh, no. Uh, the return to offices will be based on, on sections, teams, uh, you know, whole divisions in some cases, and not based on an individual uh, situation for just not liking working from home. Uh, as you'll note in the policies that we have uh, around working from home, if there are uh, circumstances where it is just untenable to continue to work from home because of the environment that uh, you're in, then that's a different conversation. But in terms of no longer liking working from home, um, uh, no, that's not going to happen on an individual basis. Uh, so we are looking at, at how uh, people will return to offices and also thinking through how we might be able to also give people a bit of a sense of a better time frame. Uh, we we do recognize, and the EOC had this conversation last week, uh, that for, for some it's, it's you know, a, a constant asking of question and, and the answer back is, well, it's a slow and gradual piece. And if we could start to give some better timing, uh, even if it's a, a little generic, but uh, giving some sense of timing to folks, uh, we know that that would be helpful. And so we are, we are taking that uh, to heart and trying to provide people with a better sense of, of the when, because uh, I, I do agree that as this goes on, we're on day 106 now, that um, simply hearing, uh, you'll hear, you'll see, uh, we'll let you know, uh, it's coming in the future. Um, those are all uh, less than satisfactory answers as people are trying to plan their own lives and planning their own environment within the home if they're going to continue to work from home or starting to prepare uh, to come back to the office if that's the case. So bear with us a little bit. There are a number of things that we're working through right now to try and give a little more clarity. But uh, as, an, as an individual employee, uh, you will not be dictating when you come back to the office that will be done uh, in conjunction with the rest of your team and in conjunction with the general reopening plan. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, next question is for Jeanette, I think. Um, so Jeanette, the hiring process has been on hold for some time now. Um, what is the time frame to go forward with testing and interviews and what will these processes look like? Uh, thanks, Jasmine. So yes, when um, the pandemic emergency first happened, we did put a pause on all hiring. And, um, but gradually, you know, there have been critical uh, positions that we'd need to fill. And so we've been uh, starting up doing hiring again, even as early as, um, as April for some of those essential critical positions. And so what we're doing is when a vacancy happens, we're kind of taking just a very short pause to say, okay, is this critical? Yep, we got to hire right away. Is this a position that somebody who uh, currently um, doesn't have sufficient work because the program area they work in is closed right now or not busy? So do we have an opportunity to redeploy? Um, and so we'll, we'll do that if we can. And an example would be we're not hiring some of our summer students we would normally hire. We're redeploying staff. And then the, the third one is that pause to say, well, no, we actually won't fill the position right now because um, there, there isn't sufficient work right now. It's a program area that's running um, at half capacity because we can't meet public health measures, et cetera. So we are taking that pause, not a long pause, but just asking those questions. And if we do you know, keep it, we can keep it open. It helps with those savings that Mike um, mentioned. But where we need, need to get hiring, it's happening. And I'm really impressed with the innovation and creativity because some positions we hire have to have testing and things like that. And the um, people leaders combined with HR are, are coming up with creative ways to ensure. I just went through a hiring process to hire our director of comms and government relations about how we can keep hiring moving forward. So it's not paused anymore. Um, but we are uh, looking at uh, just ensuring the position needs to be filled and we can't redeploy. Great, thank you, Jeanette. Um, next question will go to Dan. So the, the question is, I work on one of the upper floors of City Hall and I need to take either the stairs or the elevator to reach my office area. 
I'm concerned about how this will work. The stairs are very skinny and the elevators are not very big either. So how will the city be able to ensure people can maintain six feet of physical distance in the stairways and the elevators? Thanks, Jazz. So I guess, you know, there's infection control procedures that we are developing and will likely continue to develop for the workplace. And they are really guided by some principles. And those were the ones that Paul had in his presentation earlier around the six foot um, the, and, and all those other uh, measures that people are very aware of now. So I, I, I would ask people to consider those when they're uh, in those situations that maybe are not straightforward to them. So if you're making your way up the stairs at City Hall because there's two, two people or more people on the elevator, which hopefully there won't be, but if you feel the need to take the stairs and you can hear somebody coming down, uh, maybe you step off on the floor and, and let the person by uh, in, the, uh, in the area where the door exits to that floor. Uh, if you do find yourself uh, in a situation where you're passing somebody on the stairs, the, you know we would uh, ask that you try to avoid those situations, but maybe just look the other way. You know, the principle is to not be facing each other for long periods of time. So I uh, just really encourage people to, to look at the procedures and the principles to, to understand how to react to those situations when they find themselves in it. Uh, we will continue to uh, uh, advocate and promote the procedures that we've developed. But if people have a good understanding of those measures, uh, they'll be able to figure out when they find themselves in those situations that maybe aren't as straightforward or aren't covered by the procedures. So, uh, but those those measures around, uh, you know, washing your hands, sneezing into your elbow, keeping the six foot distance, disinfecting things that you use on a regular basis, and being aware of those things in the workplace are uh, are things that are going to keep everybody safe. Great, thank you, Dan. Next question back to Paul. Um, Paul, we talked about a little, this a little bit at our last town hall, but with the reduction of childcare centers um, and the availability of childcare, um, cancellation of school and summer camps, um, can you talk a little bit about the plans that the city has in place for employees who have childcare or other family responsibilities? Well, this is gonna be a huge challenge across the board. Uh, and there aren't, a a ton of solutions that we can we can offer manufacturing more childcare spaces uh, having all of the summer camp programs come back online is just not going to occur uh, anytime anytime soon the summer camp programs are greatly reduced uh, the city in and of itself is not operating a day a summer day camp program and uh, with the reopening of childcare uh, centers um, uh, you know grace mater and her team brought forward a report that says you know it's essentially about 55 percent of of the spaces are going to be available so so it's a it's a huge concern. I uh, I would encourage uh, our employees with families with and if you have young children or school age children that are going to uh, to need childcare, uh, start to think about what that looks like now. Um, unfortunately, there there aren't a lot of solutions that the city can just manufacture right now. And a big question mark, of course, is still what's happening with school in September. But we understand that the province's goal is that schools will uh, operate in some capacity in September. But if you look at the three scenarios that they're working through, a number of them have uh, children uh, at home, uh, not in the traditional uh, hours uh, in, in school. And that's a, a, another burden on childcare that, that hasn't been sorted out. So I will say that this is an issue across the board. It's come up in the mayor's task force around economic recovery. It's come up uh, in a meeting of anchor institutions that happened just a couple of days ago. It's uh, coming up in our own city staff. And uh, I would say to folks, we're all gonna have to be creative around that. Uh, kudos to our children's services uh, division who is working very hard with the childcare community to get them up and going in whatever capacity they can as quickly as possible. And uh, public health are doing the inspections. They've assigned new people to get these spaces up and going. So we expect there will be a lot more childcare spaces online in the next couple of weeks, which is good news. But we do know that overall, there's not gonna be enough childcare spaces. Um, talk to human resources, talk to your supervisor about the options that are available but uh, you know it's it's we're going to have to continue to have people come to work and also recognize that there are child care situations that are going to put some pressure on and again it comes back to that service planning and work planning that needs to go on across the city because these are unique challenges that are different than any other time we've gone through and until we get school back to full time until we get child care centers back to full capacity uh, there's going to be some gaps in service uh, uh, absolutely that people will have to manage through. Great, thank you, Paul. 
Um, next question will go to Mike. Um, will city employees who will be working from home longer term, such as into phase three and potentially beyond, have the ability to make any additional income tax claims on their taxes next year? So uh, why is it that I get the income tax questions or tax questions? Uh, First, I want to just uh, recognize staff, uh, a shout out uh, to IT staff, to the EOC procurement. If you think back to the early days of this pandemic, uh, staff did a great job. The uh, people leaders did a great job in getting, helping to facilitate staff being able to work remotely. Um, you know, the, um, the leveraging of technology, uh, getting desktops uh, out of our work environment into uh, individuals' homes, making sure that they're gonna function in that environment. Uh, there was uh, procurement of laptops in order to enable staff uh, to work uh, remotely. Um, there was, um, you know, subscribing to VPN, getting the platform, uh, up so that uh, rather than uh, a couple hundred uh, employees accessing VPN or, or WebEx, uh, in, you know, uh, pivoting to uh, hundreds of uh, employees using that platform on a daily basis. So a shout out uh, to, to IT staff, to the OC procurement staff uh, and others in terms of helping to facilitate that transition. Um, also early on, if you think back, as we recognize as we were going through this uh, pandemic, uh, we needed to support staff who may require some materials or supplies. And so the EOC made a decision that through supervisors, staff could request the uh, supplies or materials that they may uh, require at home. So we took those uh, initiatives uh, and we tried to satisfy those primary needs for, for staff and we discussed uh, this afternoon a bit around uh, um, you know, furniture and as we continue on through phase two and look forward is the potential need to work with HR and with, the, with supervisors and people leaders uh, in order to provide if staff have ergonomic uh, chairs in the workplace is the potential of providing access to, uh, to that furniture. To the specific question around tax deductions is uh, based on the information and criteria we have from CRA. Uh, city employees would not be entitled now to uh, tax deductions. Um, if that changes in, in the uh, weeks, months ahead, we will uh, advise staff. Uh, and just in terms of managing expectations, again, um, you know, we need to just recognize that we aren't uh, private consultants or contractors, that the city is providing technology, uh, the city is trying to provide access to materials and supplies. Uh, so the benefits may not be as great as uh, private consultants or contractors. Uh, so short answer is we're currently not uh, city employees, we're currently not eligible. Uh, but uh, again, uh, if things change, we will be uh, updating staff uh, of those changes. Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to go back to Paul. Paul, this is kind of a two-part question for you. Um, the first one, I got uh, quite a number of questions about people continuing to telecommute and work from home beyond phase three. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on the city's plans for that. And then also around those people who left very quickly to work from home in March, um, is there a plan to let those people go back and clean out their personal belongings from their, for their desks if they are going to be staying home for a long time? Sure, let's take the, the back end first because the answer is, is yes, it's, uh, it's not gonna be a free for all come whenever you want uh, a plan piece and some information will roll out soon around that. And you'll need to, to organize that as a team with your people leaders and, and, and ensure that it's done in a safe way. But uh, we do know that in some cases people uh, arrived at work and really never got to their desk. We're just told to go home. And when we did decide to, to close down our, our buildings, and uh, so there's stuff that people need to get. And as we start to articulate some folks that may be working from home for a considerable period of time, obviously we want you to, uh, uh, to have that opportunity. And to the question of beyond phase three, uh, it, it is 
part of the conversation right now to perhaps look at a longer uh, telecommuting approach and whether that is full-time uh, working from home, whether that is a rotational basis to ensure that we keep a really good distancing within the office. Uh, those are the types of conversations that are going on. Uh, as you've heard Dr. Richardson say in any of her public uh, conversations, uh, we've done a tremendous job of making sure that we did not have a surge of COVID-19 that overwhelmed our healthcare system and our other uh, support systems in the community. Uh, but we have not solved COVID-19. Uh, we do not have a large enough amount of the population that has uh, that has had the virus, and, and we don't even know what that immunity looks like. And the other piece is we don't have an immunity strategy through a vaccine or a treatment program either. So the virus is very much with us and continues to be with us. And one of the better ways for us to ensure that we uh, protect those who are who are, you know, doing work in, a, in, a, in an environment where it could be done off-site is to allow that to happen and to allow that to happen at home. So back to one of my earlier questions or answers, we, we, we are looking at, you know, what groups of, of our workforce could potentially stay at home for a much longer period of time and, and allowing that to be the way we do a lot of our work for a more considerable period of time than some of the other aspects of our reopening plan that need to follow a little bit of quicker succession. So I think you will see uh, a much stronger emphasis on where it's possible and where it has minimal impacts in terms of the public's enjoyment of services and where it has minimal impacts in terms of increased costs to have people work from home. Uh, those just make a whole bunch of sense until we know more about this virus, more about its treatment, more about how it's going to continue to evolve in this community. Uh, and, and that will help us to ensure that we can keep everybody safe. Thanks, Paul. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll go to Jeanette for some closing remarks. So, Paul, I think I'm going to come back to you again. Um, when it comes time for staff to report back to the office, um, will those facilities that have showers and change rooms be open on an enhanced cleaning schedule? Um, so with the reduced capacity on transit, many people are choosing to walk or bike to work and the showers and change rooms will be very helpful for our staff. Can you talk about that? Yeah, they will be helpful and, and the answer is yes. Uh, our, our goal is not to close down those very things that will help support people to do the kinds of things they need to. Uh, we'll look at what enhanced cleaning looks like around that. People will need to take their own personal uh, actions as well to remain safe. But um, you know, our goal is to have those work environments be very supportive of the ways people may choose to get to work that were different uh, than, than they were say March 11th before all this kicked off. And uh, we wanna support that very much so. I do know, though, that not all of our facilities have access to that, so uh, we won't be installing uh, new facilities. Uh, uh, but if you do have those available to you, um, those will certainly be uh, some of our priority to make sure that we can support our staff to get to work and feel good about the ways that they get to work. And that's all good for us from a number of standpoints If people are choosing to be more in an active transportation mode, uh, not to get off topic and, and talk about all things climate change and, and uh, uh, you know, activity related. But those are really good things that, of course, we would want to support people to, to have happen. And we'll probably be thinking about more of those ideas as things move on to encourage people to uh, take alternate forms of uh, transportation transportation to get to uh, to get to work and that includes encouraging people still to consider public transit um, we know that everybody will make their own decisions based on on what how they feel comfortable but we've done a tremendous job to make our transit system safe for both operators and passengers and that's why we've mandated masks on public transit and I'd really encourage our employees to continue to look at that as a really strong option uh, to get to and from work uh, when that uh, time comes Great, thank you, Paul. So we're just about out of time for the town hall event for today, but before we wrap up, I just want to thank once again, Jeanette, Paul, Dan, Mike, and Laura for participating today as well. Thank you to the communications team and to Cable 14 for leading the production of this town hall event. Um, I'll ask everyone, please keep up to date and informed on the city's continued response to COVID-19 and our progress as we begin to slowly reopen municipal facilities and restart those services and programs that were modified or canceled due to the pandemic. And I'll just remind you, ENET, Howie, and Hamilton.ca slash reopens are great places for the latest information. With that, I'll pass things to Jeanette. You can wrap up for us. 
Great, thanks, Jasmine. And I wanna take a moment to actually thank Jasmine. Jasmine's getting a whole new career during COVID in terms of facilitating the media questions during our media events with Paul and the mayor and Dr. Richardson, and, uh, and now with our telephone town halls. So again, it's one of those things that Paul mentioned about people of all different roles in the city are stepping up. And uh, Jasmine, I wanna recognize you because you're doing that as well, so thank you. And I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, I hope you can um, use this information to get a better appreciation of what phase two means like for the city of Hamilton and to you uh, personally in your role. But I also hope you can appreciate a couple other things. One is I know this emergency is stressful because of so many of the unknowns. And even we can't give you exact dates for the next phase of reopening. But I hope you can appreciate that as we have information, we will get it out to you to give you what certainty we can. And as Paul mentioned, if we know going through our planning, there's going to be some staff stay at home longer, we'll tell you sooner than later so you can plan around that. I hope also you can appreciate that um, the senior leadership team and members of the uh, health and our reopening team are truly making uh, and putting your health and safety first. Um, we can't protect the health and safety of the community if we don't protect the health and safety of all our, our staff. And so there's been a lot of thinking going into this to make sure if you are coming back that it's done in a safe way. And if you are being asked to stay at home and work at home longer, it's for that health and safety reasons. And lastly, I just do on behalf of the senior leadership team, uh, just thank you and recognize. I hope from the stories Paul told at the beginning about the different staff that have uh, pivoted and taken on new roles. I kind of want to drive a forklift now. Um, that this really has been a massive team approach at the city of Hamilton. And I am so proud, and we all are as a senior leadership team, how everyone has stepped up and adapted and been innovative and creative and done such an amazing job. So thank you very much. We're committed to keep you um, information coming your way. Uh, please be safe and take care of yourself and bye for now.